A lot of you found my channel through me talking about Rick Grimes and where he was and all my theories around that, but now the time has come and gone where those theories are voided. We know where Rick was, we know where he is now, and the ones who live is over. So naturally, as somebody who primarily covers The Walking Dead, I have a lot of thoughts about this show about how it was exactly what I had hoped it would be, about how it was everything I wanted it and it blew away my expectations, but also how I think some of the stuff was rushed and it wasn't altogether satisfying. But that could just be me being ungrateful because we ended up getting the true and proper end to the Walking Dead universe. Except it's not over. So in this video, I'm gonna be going over my episode to episode analysis and theories. So if you wanna see that and what I had to say each episode, feel free to watch each one. And then at the end, I'll go over my thoughts on the series as a whole. So feel free to watch the whole thing, skip around to where you wanna watch, but this is a pretty big moment for all of us Walking Dead fans, me and my channel for The Walking Dead as a whole. This could very well be the end of Rick and Michonne. They got their happy ending, and right out the gate, I feel like I should give them props for their years in this universe, and especially coming back to deliver a true ending to the series. No matter what, this does feel like a true ending to the show. All my complaints about the season 11 finale are now nullified, because this is truly what I expected out of that episode. So let's travel up to Philly, find Rick Grimes, and defeat the CRM as we talk about The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. Back when I made a video on the series finale, I said that it didn't really feel like a series finale because not all the storylines were wrapped up, and for some reason people got really angry at me for saying that, thinking I was saying that the series finale was bad or something, but now I'm doubling down on that when the show's intro uses the same music from the finale, and that ending scene was really just the prologue to this show. I feel like in the years to come, unless you want to see everything The Walking Dead has to offer, when people are new to the series and binging it, they're going to go from watching The Walking Dead to The Ones Who Live, and it really does feel like the most natural progression of the story. But right away, there was an immediate sense that this show was different. The tone was different, the production quality was different, the vibes were different, and that carried throughout the entire episode, and I'm hoping will carry throughout the whole show. It's hard to describe, but it just gave me a different feeling. One that I used to have when I watched the early to mid seasons of the actual show, but I haven't had that feeling again for a very long time until I watched this episode. There's some overall aspects to the episode that I love. I love the cinematic look, I love the art design, this slightly futuristic but still modern looking military. I think that the change to the CRM design was a great one, but you can also see the semblance of the same design, like it's a natural progression of it over time in universe. I think the music also has that same slightly futuristic but modern sound to it, kind of reminded me of the Tenet soundtrack mixed with some Last of Us, because of course of course it is. I also like that we got two Rick Grimes F-bombs in the same scene. People kept on saying that this show feels like it's on HBO, and it absolutely did. This doesn't feel like anything we've seen before in this universe, and that's a good thing. In the opening scene, we see Rick about to do what he's gonna do, and this is such a telling sign about what's happened without even showing us. If Rick is here mentally, then shit must be pretty bad, and they weren't lying when they said we'd see Rick at the lowest he's ever been. Then we cut to five years after the bridge, and I knew that this was going to be the very start of a very large mountain that they had to climb. They're taking us back to the beginning, and it's going to take a very long time, probably all six episodes to show us what he's been up to, why he hasn't actually escaped yet, but what I did not expect was for them to answer all of this to a completely satisfying degree in one one-hour episode. Rick cutting off his own hand is a hugely controversial moment, even among people who liked the episode, especially because it ultimately didn't lead to anything, he didn't even escape or even get very far from this attempt. A lot of people were saying that he should have cut off the leash itself instead of his hand, and I feel like that's a pretty valid complaint, but this also wasn't Rick's first rodeo. We learn he tried to escape four times. The third time was the one that we saw in the series finale, so maybe one of the first two attempts were similar to this leash one, and that's why he knew it had to be his hand. Andrew Lincoln's performance is 
Of course, absolutely incredible, we know this, but just seeing new Rick Grimes scenes feels like a dream at this point. Also, they did a partnership with Call of Duty, but now I think it's Assassin's Creed's turn. Speaking of dreams, let's talk about the dream sequences with Michonne. They really confused me. I'm not exactly sure what their point was, the whole Rick and Michonne meeting for the first time, I'm not sure if this was included for new viewers of the show to remind us of their chemistry. If it was, then that's just confusing for new viewers because this wasn't how they met at all. For a minute, I was thinking that maybe this was a glimpse at the future, that they're doing some sort of role play, but I think that's just because I recently watched Arrival. So I'm not sure if these will be like the only dream sequences, if they're leading to something bigger or what. I didn't think that they were bad scenes, just confusing. We meet Pearl, and I think she's a fine character so far. She has Rick's back, at least for now. I was really, really hoping that they wouldn't introduce some sort of romantic connection between them just to cause unnecessary drama. There were a few times that I was thinking that was the direction they were going. She seems already broken enough and lost hope on seeing the person she loves, and she was trying to convince Rick to give up too. But they didn't, and I hope that this isn't some sort of like revelation later on that they actually are together, and now Rick chooses Michonne, but makes him out to be the asshole who gave up on her. She also had a really great line when Rick is saying that his wife and his family aren't gone, and she said, no, they aren't, but you are. Given the circumstances that they're in, talking about life and death, I thought that that was a pretty great line. Esteban was immediately such a likable guy. I do hope we get to see more of him and how he was able to break through Rick's shell to make him laugh and smile. But when Esteban suggests to Rick that he join the military and then try to escape then, and Rick has this like light bulb go off in his head, I'm like, come on, Rick, you didn't think of that yourself. You've been here for how many years and you didn't think, oh, I'm just going to join the military, then try to escape. The pacing and the training montage of Rick becoming a soldier, learning to fly a helicopter and fight, all of this was so well done and cinematic. We might have never gotten proper movies, but this episode, for all intents and purposes, was a damn movie. Okafor was certainly the most interesting new character. Learning about his backstory and his desire to recruit Rick was cool, but when he brought Rick and Pearl aside to talk about the CRM, that was really interesting for a number of reasons. Number one, we finally got confirmation on what A and B actually means. And with the explanation and the context given, it makes so many of Jadis' scenes make more sense. And number two, I don't think a lot of people picked up on this, but one of the books he gives them is The Art of Peace, aka Morgan's Book. Is this just a nod to the character, or is this hinting at a Morgan appearance in the show? Also, when he talked about wanting to change the CRM for the better, I knew in that moment that he was going to die that Rick or Pearl was going to take over and try to complete his vision. I didn't expect it to be in this episode, but whatever. I still think that ultimately that's what's going to happen. Maybe Rick is torn to stay with the CRM now and try to change things for the better because the CRM actually has the ability to make a difference in the world. Rick's final escape attempt was really well done, the plan itself was genius, Esteban helping him was really great, and it might have even worked. When we saw that little girl, I was deathly afraid of the direction the show was heading in, but it turned out just to be part of that scene, and thank god it was just that scene. I mentioned in the last video I made that Michonne wasn't in possession of the message in the bottle that Rick threw, so maybe that will come back. I saw a couple comments, people saying that they think it's Morgan or Michonne or Daryl who is going to find it, and I thought that was all incredibly plausible, but instead... Okafor found it, and I think that it was super important for the plot that he did find it. When he mentioned Michonne being an unusual name, how easy it would be to track her and everybody else down from the point that they picked him up, that's something that I had not considered, and it's a huge factor in Rick's character change. He knows now that if he ever did escape, it wouldn't be that hard for them to track him, Michonne, and everybody else down. So from this point on, he really considers himself stuck. I also loved hearing the story about Rick's dad. We've known this character for a decade and think that we know everything there is to know, and here comes a bit of backstory and insight to continue our love and care for this character that we already have a lot of love and care for. I hope that we get to see or hear more backstory stuff like this with both Rick and Michonne. If you had told me that 
we would see the majority of Rick's backstory and where he's been in just one episode, and that by the end of it, the CRM will have broken him to the point that he's not even trying to escape anymore, I'd have told you that's a terrible idea, there's no way that they can explain Rick's absence and his change of heart in a single episode. Yet, here we are. They did that, and they did it so well that I have zero problems with the story they went with. This massive hill that they had to climb with Rick's absence has largely been told, and now they can move on with more of the present story. I realized that I didn't have a ton of faith that they'd handle this correctly, because for that you need really smart writing and careful pacing, something that the show really hasn't had in a long time. But they pulled out all the stops for this one, and they absolutely nailed it. Now, I don't think that all of Rick's backstory has been told. If this is all we end up getting, I won't be super disappointed, but I'd also like to learn more about his first two attempts to escape, him actually drawing the pictures of Michonne and Judith, and maybe some explanation for that. And I was almost going to bet money that the opening scene of the show was going to be Rick waking up in a hospital to mirror the first episode, and that didn't happen. But I'm also not super disappointed that it didn't happen. I'm still hoping that we might actually get to see this scene unfold in like Rick's first few days in the CRM. The earliest we saw Rick was five years in, and they handle all that really well with Rick's voiceover and some of the exposition that they gave us with the TV and the loudspeaker, but I think seeing Rick actually wake up and learn about this world that he's in would be really cool if it was necessary to the story. But I think what we're all shocked by is the reunion. Not that it happened, because we all knew that they would reunite, but that it happened in episode one. Now I know some people are disappointed by this because they thought that most of the show would be about their journeys over the years and then reunite in like the fourth or fifth episode, but that's not the story they're telling. They're not telling us the story of what happened before, they're telling us the story of these two characters, how much they've changed and how it affects their love story. They told us this in what I thought was a pretty cryptic synopsis, but reading this now makes a lot more sense. It's looking like the next episode is going to cover Michonne's story and where she's been what she's been up to, and again, if you had told me this would be the structure of the season, I'd have thought that that was a really bad idea, but with how beautifully crafted this episode was, I'm honestly just excited to see how the rest of the story unfolds in whatever manner they want to tell it in. It's been a long time since I felt this way about The Walking Dead. It's been a long time since I've been shocked and surprised and completely satisfied by an episode of this show. And this episode did it all. Maybe hindsight will change this once we get the whole season or something, but this episode did everything I wanted it to and more. Are there some nitpicks I have? Sure, we all do, but this episode to me was a 10 out of 10. If this is the future of this universe, then we're in good hands, and I hope that they keep this up. This isn't a one episode wonder. Even if it is, I'm going to enjoy this for what it is and just be happy with the outcome that we got. Was this episode worth the five year wait? Yes, it absolutely was. I mean that, and I didn't really think I'd mean it going into the episode. We start the episode off basically where we last saw Michonne, meeting these two people and then going on to join their caravan. She's basically being interviewed, recapping her whole story thus far, and she's telling the absolute truth. This is obviously hugely contrasted later on in the episode when we see what's basically the same scene, but now Michonne is lying and doing a pretty damn good job at it too. These two scenes contrast each other really well and are a pretty visual representation of the difference between A's and B's. Michonne is a through and through A, her conversation at the beginning shows this, how she's actively searching for somebody and helping people on the way, helping people to a degree that they literally follow her later on in the episode. But her second, fake conversation shows us the characteristics of a B, clinging to the hope of the old world, just wanting to be somewhere and be safe, not questioning the whys or hows of the CRM, and that's exactly the type of people that they're looking for. But we're also introduced to a variety of side characters and hear about their stories. We've got Aiden and Bailey, who we saw way back in Season 10, and even though their time in this episode is short, I think it's very cool that this is how their story continued. They could have very easily just had King Bach in for a cameo in Season 10 and then start this episode with Michonne being introduced to new characters. But just for continuity's sake, it's nice to see them here. 
We see their connection to this traveling caravan of people, their relationship to each other, and also the stakes that they're personally facing. Mainly the fact that Aiden is pregnant. Michonne tells them to go to Alexandria, and for a few minutes I really figured that they would eventually end up there at the end of the series. That Michonne's friends and Rick's friends would band together and they'd overcome the odds of the CRM, and if this was back in the main show or even in the spin-offs, that's exactly what would happen. But not in The Ones Who Live, which, after this episode, is starting to seem like a strange title. We also meet Nat, a hyperactive and eccentric character who's good at building different gadgets, a few of which are extremely extremely helpful. He's responsible for getting Michonne her new armor, we get to see the scene from the series finale play out in real time, which is really cool, and they barely call attention to that, and we even hear Nat's backstory from before the apocalypse, his stepdad danger, and all of this was leading to another great side character, the level of which we hadn't seen for a long time, until Okafor from last week, but before that it was even longer. We saw what happened to Oak 4 last week, so I'm really hoping it's not the same case for Nat. Oh, come on. But before that happened, we see Michonne and these people have their first encounter with the CRM, and it's far darker than anything I expected. I remember seeing this shot of the gas falling on them in the trailer, but I certainly didn't expect the scene to play out the way it did. The first 20 minutes of this episode set up these side characters to be primary figures in Michonne's journey, just to take them away in an excruciating and horrifying way. I was also wondering how they were going to show another time jump, because we weren't quite caught up with Rick's timeline from the previous episode, and forcing Michonne and Nat to quite literally just sit around while their throat and lungs heal felt really painful to watch. Painful in the sense that these characters just went through an extreme loss, and Michonne really feels like she's getting closer to Rick, so to just sit around for months at a time was really hard to sit through. But this whole sequence and episode is paced extremely well. It does a great job of building up that hope that Michonne is going to help these people and find Rick and it'll all be okay just to break us all down, reinforcing the idea that the CRM is not to be messed with and they truly are a menacing force. The side characters were constantly reminding Michonne when they face hard circumstances that she should go home, be with her children, to believe that Rick is still out there, but also to give up while you're ahead. All these conversations really get to Michonne, she has every reason to believe them and to believe that Rick is gone, but then we of course find out that he's not. With how everything went in this episode, it now seems like an absolutely crazy coincidence that this is how she found Rick. I've seen a few comments of people who take issue with this, but to that I say what I always say, storytelling is built on coincidences. And I believe that this is an excellent way to reunite these characters. It's not anticlimactic, it's emotional, and to me it just works on all levels. The reunion itself, we weren't sure how things were going to go because at the end of the last episode it seemed like it wasn't going to be all that happy, and I didn't think it would be happy, but this is probably one of the happiest moments in all of The Walking Dead. This moment was for the fans of the series that have stuck around this long. For the people who waited anxiously for years for this moment, for this show, for everything, and it did not disappoint. Everyone gave Andrew Lincoln some deserved props for his acting in the last episode, now it's time to give Denai hers. I think that her reaction is so raw and real, and as this episode is mostly focused on Michonne, she really makes this reunion scene what it is. I can't help but think that that second hug and I found you wasn't scripted, it was just something that Denai felt Michonne would do after all this time, or maybe it was scripted because these two really understand these characters. Either way, the moment was incredible, it was worth the wait, I was crying my eyes out, but immediately after, we're snapped back to the reality that we're in, and Nat is killed. I also love that Rick doesn't know who this guy is at all, but Michonne is upset about his death, so Rick goes over and kills the other guy, doesn't have the context, doesn't need it, he just does what he has to for Michonne. But when the CRM is coming to take Michonne, Rick has to tell her what to do in order to survive. These few lines of dialogue are incredible. It explains everything that it needs to for Michonne to survive as a bee, for her to be accepted without any indication she's with Rick him yelling at her not to call them walkers because that's what he calls them. It covers everything head to toe and it's just up to Dana now to sell it. 
and she absolutely does. When they see each other again the next day, I'm assuming, I love how they're just like two high schoolers sneaking out from class to go make out. This is another really nice moment, but spells a certain trouble. The first thing that really stood out to me here was that Michonne didn't tell Rick about RJ. She's saying that she has some stuff to tell him for when they escape. It's not like they're forgetting about RJ. They did have a flash to him earlier in the episode, but I'm interested to see how this information gets out because now it's gotta be some sort of big moment. Rick is either gonna be close to giving up again or something like that, but the news of RJ will jerk him back onto the mission or maybe it will just be him when he gets back home and meets RJ for the first time. That's when he finds out about him. Whatever it is, it's something to keep your eye out for because it's gonna be important. But the scene also introduces Michonne to a new side of Rick. She mentions his hand and he says, oh, that happened during one of the last times I tried to escape a few years ago. And she's like, what do you mean by that? She also talks about stopping the red soldiers, if they can do anything to stop these people, and Rick's kind of just like, nope, and we can't even really try either. Michonne is really taken back by Rick's thoughts because none of this sounds like him at all, but we've seen why he feels this way, and at least to me, the way he feels and why he says these things makes sense. Michonne then realizes that this place is not like Woodbury, it's not like Terminus, the Saviors, the Whisperers, this is something that she's never faced before. Maybe she understands why Rick is talking the way he is, or maybe she sees something different. And with how we saw Rick actually giving up on finding his family in the last episode, burning all the letters and the drawings, these things are gonna come back to bite him in the ass. His whole, I'm not with them when they first reunite was not even actually true, because in that helicopter he said that he was in fact with them. Rick's past is certainly gonna come out to Michonne, the stuff that we know about and the stuff that we don't know about, which leads me to Jadis. The ending scene throws a lot of different information at us all at once, information that we don't have the full story on. Jadis mentions that Michonne being here disrupts their long-standing deal, which obviously makes us wonder what this long-standing deal could be. Jadis' presence here throws a wrench in the plan and raises the stakes because she obviously knows who Michonne is, but as of right now, I'm not too happy with the direction this seems to be going in. I mentioned this a little bit in my video on the last episode, but especially after this episode, I'm very curious to fill in some of those blanks from the five years that we didn't see. What was Rick's first couple days, weeks, months, years like in the CRM? This episode raised some bigger questions about Rick, like why were the people at the docks all shoeless and burned? Was Rick here? Is this why his boots are gone? What about all the drawings on the phones, especially one with Japanese on it? Could these just be drawings? Sure, but why are they on phones and not just paper? And now, obviously, what's the deal between him and Jadis? I wonder if there's going to be some sort of big reveal during those initial five years that changes everything. These are all questions that I'm not only hoping to see answers to, but expecting to see answers to. So let's move on to some of the questions or aspects that maybe we won't have answers to, but I'm still hoping. Throughout the episode, Michonne is trying to contact Shoto, or Judith, on the radio. But they say that if she's in Virginia, she's probably out of range. Except the audience knows something that Michonne does not, and that's that Judith is not in Virginia, she's in Ohio at the Commonwealth. I'm not sure if this is something that they're gonna address in this series, if they're gonna eventually make it back to Alexandria just to find out that everybody's at the Commonwealth now, or if this series was written with the idea that everybody is still in Alexandria and that's just where they'll be if they get back there. Because Michonne doesn't know about the Commonwealth, and it seems for some reason neither does the CRM. I'm not sure if the Commonwealth is going to be an important factor. The spinoffs didn't just forget about it, because in Daryl Dixon he says that he's from a place called the Commonwealth, but neither Deny or Andrew Lincoln were ever a part of any Commonwealth storyline in the show, so does this mean that they're not going to mention it? Could Judith be more in range at the Commonwealth than she was in Virginia? I'm not too sure how these radios work, but maybe. We also know of somebody else that has a radio like this. Could the first person who makes contact with Rick and Michonne with this radio actually be Morgan? I do eventually think we're going to get some sort of appearance from both Judith and RJ, more than just these quick flashes of them, and there was also some other castmates at the premiere of the show, which I know doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be in it, but it would be really cool if they were. 
I'm really just wondering how the previous established continuity is going to fit into this show, but that's also me saying that by the end of this series, Rick and Michonne are going to make it home, which might not be the case at all. One of the more interesting things that this episode introduced us to was the whole herd migration aspect. They said that the herds of walkers move south and then back up north again. This sort of explains why there's always random hordes of walkers in the main show. I guess it's due to the migration patterns. This could just be a bit of in-universe lore, or it could potentially be an important plot point going forward. A herd of walkers this big could probably overwhelm anyone if they were given a certain direction to go. Part of me wonders if Rick and Michonne could use this walker migration to their advantage and take out a big chunk of the CRM's units by unleashing this horde onto them. I can definitely see that happening, maybe it's something they have to do in order to escape, even if it means the fall of the CRM or the whole city of Philadelphia. I just think it would be very interesting to see Rick and Michonne's decision if it somehow came down to staying at the CRM together or destroying a city of 200,000 innocent people just so they can escape. How would it come down to that? I don't know. I don't know how they'd write it or how it would come to that. I just think that would be a very interesting scenario to see unfold. The lengths in which they're willing to go to escape back to their family, even if it's the deaths of innocent people. So for this week's episode highlights, I gotta go with the happy reunion between Rick and Michonne. This was everything the fans could have hoped for, a really happy moment that also springs us forward with a story at hand and opens up a lot of exciting possibilities. Denai Guerrera absolutely killed it in this episode, we should be giving her the same amount of praise we gave Andrew Lincoln last week, seeing her break down and cry giving up hope on seeing Rick was really hard to watch because of how strong Michonne has always been, and obviously her reaction to seeing Rick made the moment for me. The music in this episode was far different than the synth electric vibe from the first episode. In a lot of ways, this sounded more like the early seasons of The Walking Dead, and also of course, The Last of Us, while the first episode sounded more like the seasons 4-6 to six music. The pacing was incredible, I really thought this episode was going to end right where the first one did, but seeing their actual reunion and a bit of Michonne at the CRM was not at all what I expected, but this show keeps on surprising me in the best ways. So I've got some quick thoughts before I go into the bigger moments of the episode. Number one, I really liked this tally of Rick being the record holder for the most walker kills, and seeing that from Michonne's perspective shows her that he's been here for a while, and it's just a really cool detail. I said in my community update that the music was very Last of Us inspired, and I was shocked that a lot of you disagreed with me. I mean, just listen to this scene. No, but seriously, this music does remind me of The Last of Us, and I'm not saying that's really an issue right now, but some comments were right, The Last of Us doesn't own guitar music in an apocalypse, but what worries me about the future of The Walking Dead, and honestly the zombie genre as a whole, is that the success of The Last of Us is just gonna lead to more Last of Us inspired themes, art, music, we're already kind of seeing that with the zombie genre. Some people were saying that Daryl Dixon was a flat out Last of Us ripoff. While I think it's good to see the zombie genre still thriving and for different projects to take inspiration from each other, I don't want everything from this point forward to just be the Last of Us as the standard and go from there. Rant over in that regard, if you saw my video on last week's episode, you'll know that I misinterpreted to a huge degree what was going on between Rick and Jadis, but Jadis certainly does have the hots for Rick, I don't blame her, I do too, but that's definitely not reciprocated on Rick's end. You're a hero. With a shit haircut. <laughs> One thing I thought about even in the last episode with Michonne arriving at the CRM, I mean they kind of screwed it now, but what if Rick was just like, yeah, this is my wife, we have a kid, if we can bring our kid here, I won't ever try to escape again and we'll just be happy and I'll keep on doing what I'm supposed to do here. Does the CRM not allow you to have a family? I mean I wouldn't doubt it, we haven't seen anybody else with a family, but would this have worked? As much as I want to see like Rick and Daryl and even Rick and Negan on screen again and see everybody reunite, I feel like having his whole actual family here would probably be enough for him to actually stay at this point. The scene of Michonne finding the artist felt so strange to me. I honestly thought it was a dream sequence at first, he's just like, oh yeah, you're Michonne, and she's like, yep, that's me. 
What if they're in like a dining hall or something and this guy's just like, hey, Michonne, come sit over here next to me. It just felt strange. They've done so much to hide Michonne's identity, but she was so clear with this stranger and it felt really out of character for Michonne. Also, we now have confirmation that this is a picture of Judith, not Carl, though he did try and draw Carl, he just couldn't get it right. I'm still hoping for a Chandler Riggs appearance in some sort of dream sequence or something along those lines, but having him mentioned is pretty nice. But anyways, we got another flashback sequence. This was part of the leaked footage that we saw come out a few months ago, and this gave us some answers. How Jadis is involved with the CRM in the first place, and how she skipped consignment by bringing in Rick. I'm still not entirely sure why Rick is such a big deal for her to skip her consignment. I'm assuming it has something to do with Okafor seeing something in Rick, so they just gave Jadis a higher authority. But if it's not that, then I really have no clue how she skipped consignment. The scene was meant to introduce us to Jadis again, back from the time that we knew her in The Walking Dead. She has the fake wig and everything, so I think this probably is it for flashbacks in this show. It also highlights Rick saying how he's gonna get home no matter what, and then we skip to present time to a very different Rick. So far, I've absolutely loved everything they've done with Rick's character, which was personally what I was the most worried about going into the show. In this episode, Rick is really the personification of the phrase if you love them, let them go. This is a broken Rick. He's scared of what will happen to Michonne and everybody back home if anybody finds out the truth. So for as happy as he is to see Michonne, Rick really wants her to leave. He sets up this elaborate plan of escape, leaving her a letter that says his time is done, he can't escape, he's really stuck between a rock and a hard place, so Michonne, you should probably leave. But of course, she doesn't leave. Even by the end, when he's essentially telling Michonne they're done, she just doesn't take that sitting down. Literally. But an aspect that I really love, and this might be a bit controversial, but I think Rick is also starting to kind of believe in the CRM. Maybe not as it is right now, but he mentions to Thorne how she has to help Michonne get into the CRM, because it's what Okafor would have wanted. Is this just him giving Thorne an excuse as to why she should save Michonne? Yeah, of course it is, but Rick sees all that the CRM is able to accomplish, and he thinks that maybe if he can finish what Okafor started, then this really could be the last light of the world. That's where I think that inner con conflict comes from with Rick's character. He wants to look out and do what's best for his family, and that means staying here and trying to make the world a better place. There is no alternative option for Rick. There's no deal to be made. He's here, and he's here forever in his own mind. I've seen some comments about how the show is going woke by making Rick like this, but I disagree 100%. I think that both Rick and Michonne's characters and conflicts make complete sense. Rick's been trapped here, and he's made the best life for himself that he can because he understands the true stakes of his decisions, whereas Michonne doesn't realize that. She just found the love of her life, and she's not leaving without him. One of the biggest things to come out of this episode is Thorne being promoted. There's been some interesting conversations around this so far. Some people think that she understands the complete bigger picture than Rick does. Others think that she's in on Rick's plan, but to me, I simply think the power is getting to her head. Why has all this power gone to her head? I think that has something to do with the Echelon briefing, but I'll get to more on that in a minute. While we have a very different Rick, we more or less have the same Michonne. She understands that the CRM is a big beast, but she's not convinced it's impossible to escape. She doesn't think that Rick or her have done everything they can to escape, certainly not together, and she's not leaving until they get out or die trying. But Michonne still has that optimism that Rick doesn't. She hasn't even tried escaping at all, and the one time she had an opportunity to, she didn't take it. So in her mind, she's probably like, dude, come on, if it was this easy the first time, and I've only been here for a few days, we can definitely get out of here together. She doesn't understand the full stakes of what's going on, what Jadis has threatened, and how badly this could end up, not only for her and Rick, but for her kids and everybody else she loves back home. She's also terrible at acting like a bee, and Rick's pretty terrible at hiding knowing who she is. The ending was crazy, but now there's no going back. Michonne kind of outed herself right here, put all the cards on the table, so it's either they try to escape now or they're dead. I think that Michonne is going to tell Rick about RJ, and that's going to change everything for him. 
They haven't really had any time to talk across these three episodes, just little snippets of conversations here and there, but now they're going to get a chance to actually talk about everything, and I think Michonne is going to be able to change Rick's mind. And I think that a scene of him asking about all the other characters would be pretty cool. Rick would also probably be pretty pissed to hear that Michonne left in the middle of the war with the Whisperers. One thing we heard a lot about in this episode was the upcoming summit, where all the CRM higher-ups are going to be at this one place for a big event. And this has got to be where some big shit goes down. Summit was also one of the code names for the production, so this summit is super important. I don't imagine it'll be in the next episode, but probably either episode 5 or 6. There's also a big question mark about this Echelon briefing. Okafor talked about it with Rick right before he died, and it obviously changed Thorne's perspective on a lot of things, so what actually is the Echelon briefing? I think whatever's in this briefing, maybe it's going out and killing innocent people, destroying every community that they're partnered with, whatever it is, it's obviously going to be some sort of huge reveal. Maybe it's going to be that Heath is the one pulling the strings from behind the curtain, or Dr. Jenner and Jackie who didn't die, they're the ones in charge of the CRM. No, I, I hope it's nothing cheesy like that, but it's got to be some sort of big reveal in whatever the Echelon briefing is. I'm betting that we're going to see this summit and this Echelon briefing come together in one of the upcoming episodes. It'll probably end up being a really big episode with the death of Thorn or Jadis or maybe even General Beale, which I personally would be pretty disappointed with. We got to see more of General Beale in this episode, but there's still a lot to be desired out of this character. He seems like he doesn't fully trust Rick, he's got some sort of insight as to what Okafor was up to, but I'm still unsure about his motivations, his inner conflicts, so the character has to be built up a bit more. Given that this is the halfway point, I want to see him have a bigger role in the upcoming episodes, and possibly even beyond these episodes. This was the low point of the season thematically. Rick is broken, Michonne says I don't know if we'll be back in her voiceover to Judith, and now they're somewhere close to the west coast which is way further than they've ever been before. I still think this is a bit of a bridge episode, nothing too major or extreme happened like it did in the first two episodes, and that's fine, not every single episode needs to have some big moment or shock value to keep me on the edge of my seat, this episode was dedicated to showing us where our characters are at mentally, and moving around the chess pieces so that way they can call checkmate in a few episodes. The quality, storytelling, performances are still all top notch, and even this is a better episode than we're used to seeing in this universe over the past couple years. I'm not sure if I scored last week's episode, so that gets a 9.2, and this week's gets an 8.5. I said last week the characters were at their lowest points, and this week, by the end of the episode, I think that this is where our characters are at their highest points. Because I don't think this is going to last. At all. There's a lot of small points to go over, but the highlight of this episode is obviously the performances and Denai Guerrero's writing, because for those who don't know, she actually wrote the episode. So I'm going to go over these snippets of their conversation and some other stuff, but really the bulk of this episode was all about their conversations and the performances they put on because it was all masterfully done. Each character gets their moments to shine, and they each deserve all the praise in the world for this episode alone. First up, I want to talk about the RJ reveal, which goes in a different direction than I thought it would. Rick hears it, and it does make him think twice, but it's really just another piece of information that Michonne uses to show Rick how different he is and the way that he's acting. I also think it's funny how she talks about RJ, how he looks like Rick, and he's really stubborn, and all these stories of him, because we don't really get that from watching the show whatsoever. In fact, a lot of times I utterly and completely forgot about RJ during the main show, because he was just never important. But right at the start, we're introduced to this building that still has electricity, water, a Roomba. And at first I was thinking, what kind of CRM facility is this? And it turns out that it wasn't, and this is just a place that's up and running with no outside interference whatsoever. Denai said that this building was like a nice cozy cocoon for our characters, and they had to break free from it, which they did, but it's unfortunate because this place was absolutely incredible. Imagine if, like, the Season 5 group just stumbled upon this place, it would literally be heaven. 
I also liked how Michonne talked about the Roomba because I was like, wait a minute, did these things even exist when the outbreak started? And she clarified that they in fact did just come out. All this talk of Rick being different finally pays off in this episode, and I remember saying last week that Rick is really trying to make the CRM a better place, and he's trying to finish what Okafor started, and some people in the comments absolutely ripped me apart, saying I misunderstand Rick, that they shouldn't even watch my videos anymore because I'm so wrong. Some dude wrote like this whole paragraph in all caps about how wrong I was. Well, I hope you're watching this video because... I told you so. He also continues talking about how he can change the CRM for future generations so that way they have a chance, how he has to let the crops burn in order to change something, and Michonne doesn't really know what he's talking about, but this is a callback to what Rick told Okafor in the helicopter at the end of episode 1, which was a really great scene, and this is a really great callback. I loved Rick and Michonne's back and forth in this episode when they're trying to escape the building, the little fights, but how they're working together and still angry at each other. It's kind of like the epitome of what relationships are. Really? Sorry. We also get a good amount of callbacks to the actual series, like Michonne's a scar on her back and all about that episode, with Daryl and Michonne looking for Rick's body, and that's a conversation that makes complete sense because of the scar, but I also wish that we got to hear more about the other people. I wish Rick had asked about Daryl and Michonne was like, oh yes, Judith loves her uncle Daryl. Just something small like that would have made me smile, but at least she did mention Daryl was looking for Rick. One thing that didn't make me smile, it made me bawl my eyes out, was the mention of Rick's dreams about Carl, how he would dream about him and then dream about Michonne, like we saw in the first episode, and then Michonne handing him the picture of Carl on the phone, which was just so emotional because Rick stopped seeing Carl's face because he didn't know what he looked like anymore. I know that sounds crazy to some people, but that does happen if you don't see somebody for 10 plus years, you're enduring all kinds of different trauma, but Michonne got it right and Andrew Lincoln's breakdown was really what sold the scene for me on how sad it really was. One thing this episode addresses head on is how Michonne left her kids to find Rick. Michonne gets a bad rap for this decision. I've said it a bunch of times in previous videos, a lot of people mention it in the comments, but from Denai's performance, you can really see just how hard it's been to be away from them. All the sacrifices she's made to get to Rick just for him to be a completely different person absolutely crushes her, but that's why this episode was needed, to get him away from the CRM and go through this therapy session to get his head screwed on right. The building starts crumbling and Michonne doesn't let them leave until they figure out their next move move, which is such a power move, and honestly, it's what ultimately changes Rick's perspective. We get a really funny moment of Rick not being able to drive stick shift, and then they go on their merry way. For now. With how this series is being paced, I don't think that they can wrap all of this up in another two episodes. I don't think that Rick and Michonne return to Alexandria and reunite with everybody and it's just one big happy ending. Even Scott Gimple said so in the after the episode. But Thrifty, Rick and Michonne left, they're on their way back, how can this not end with them getting home? Now for this next bit, I'm gonna get into some spoilery territory, which I don't do often, but I think it's necessary for the next bit of theory rising and speculation. If you don't want to hear anything, I completely understand you turning off the video. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one. But if you do want to hear this theory, then continue on ahead. This comes from the TWD Universe Network Instagram page. If you don't already, you should go and check them out. The link is at the top of my bio, and this is where I found this theory. So for the spoiler portion, I'm just going to say it very plainly. We know that Rick ends up back with the CRM. How? Why? I don't know. I haven't looked into that, but we do know that he ends up back there. In the trailer for next week's episode, we see a cloaked figure following them, and from the actual trailers, we can conclude that this figure following them is, in fact, Jadis. Michonne says this doesn't end with us going home, so something in the next episode is going to switch Michonne's perspective heavily, so I think it's going to switch over to Rick convincing Michonne that everything is going to be alright and they'll work through all of this together, a nice flip from this episode, and a pretty realistic outcome look on actual relationships, when one is freaking out, the other brings them up, and vice versa. Jadis has always been the one to throw a wrench in these plans, for any plans for that matter, and for that reason, she's gotta go. 
and I think she will be going in the next episode. But if she's dead, then her contingency plan is going to come forth, and Rick and Michonne and everyone they love and where they all are is going to be brought forth. Rick is ultimately going to have to be the one who has to stop that from happening, and in the process, Michonne is going to have to leave and return to Alexandria to warn everyone about the CRM. From there, she'll learn about the Commonwealth, the numbers that they have, and Michonne is going to raise an army that's going to be able to take down the CRM. That means her and Mercer will basically be in charge of the army, and that's a frightening thing to imagine. Mercer was the best character introduced in Season 11, and to see him come back into the fold in this way would be absolutely incredible. Rick is going to continue his duty of raising A's and trying to change the CRM from within, so that when Michonne does raise this army, She'll have Rick and his crew on the inside waiting to help her out, disable the helicopters and stuff, so it'll be an even fight. But where does this leave the other spin-offs? Maggie is in charge of a new place in New Jersey called The Bricks. Why New Jersey? This theory states that Michonne sent Maggie there to establish a new base close to Philadelphia, so that way the army can regroup there and then head to Philly when it's time. I also think it's important to note that Dead City is the furthest along in the timeline that we've seen, so it's going to be an additional three years after the events of The Ones Who Live before we see any sort of crossover whatsoever, which is kind of sad to think about, but I think this is where Negan could also play a key role in raising an army in New York that could help them out against the CRM. As for Daryl Dixon, who's the one that came back? Michonne is. Rick's alive and Michonne came back, but Daryl doesn't know this, so Carol's going to look for him, partly because he's going to be a key player in the war ahead, but also because she just needs to know if he's okay. And maybe Daryl in Season 2 will be able to raise some sort of army in France to go up against the CRM. While at first we were all pretty disappointed there was no CRM mentions or Rick mentions in Dead City and Daryl Dixon, what if there were? What if all of this was done in service of Rick and we just didn't didn't know about it. So when we get The Walking Dead Season 12 or whatever crossover spinoff, it's gonna ultimately lead to everyone versus the CRM and Rick taking control from within to change this place to be in service of the world, not just to destroy any civilization they come across. To me, this sounds like a pretty good theory. I'm sure there's some holes in it and it won't go down exactly like this, but if it were, then I'd be pretty happy. They're telling one grand story about everyone taking down the CRM, but sprinkling in these little stories in between, and that's the kind of connected universe that I want to see. If it's not exactly like this, then I'm hoping for something similar. I know a lot of this video was the theory and not really going over the episode, so sorry for that, but in all honesty, there wasn't that much to break down from this episode. In no way does that make it a bad episode, but this was all about their conversations and the performances in which the information is delivered. I can break down the things they say word for word if you want, and what I think it all means, but it's not going to be as good as seeing these two on screen for yourselves. So I thought this would be a good video to talk about the future of the franchise. I'm going to give this episode itself a 9 out of 10. In the opening sequence, we got the biggest surprise of the show so far with an appearance of Father Gabriel. This was certainly not something I had on my bingo card for the show, but in hindsight, his appearance makes complete sense in an effort to further along Jadis' development. This also wrapped up a few loose ends to make the happenings on the main show make a little more sense. For example, right at the start, we see that Father Gabriel isn't super shocked to see the helicopters, and over the course of the episode, we can assume that Father Gabriel knows that they are probably helicopters that belong to Jadis's secretive group. This makes sense as to why he never told anybody he saw a helicopter in the main show. He was keeping Jadis and his meeting with her a secret from everyone for years. The verdict is still out as to why Negan never said anything. Oh, right, never mind. I also like how his appearance over the years kept in line with the established timeline. He mentions how his people are starving and hopes she could help them out, to which Jadis of course says no, and this is right in line with the beginning of season 11 when they meet with the Reapers and they're running low on food. But the star of this episode truly is Jadis, and I thought that for being a supporting character in three different Walking Dead shows, she probably had one of the more dignified and important deaths in the show. She also went out in true Walking Dead fashion, getting snuck up on by walkers that came out of nowhere, and then getting put down by Rick Grimes. Jadis was always a bit of a wild card, but especially in this show. 
Going into it, I didn't know if she was going to be a bad guy keeping Rick at the CRM, or if she was going to eventually try to help him escape. The answer isn't both, but it's definitely not neither. In her final moments, Jadis died and Anne came back telling Rick and Michonne where the dossier was and accepting her death with open arms. I was honestly kind of hoping she would tell them that she was lying and she didn't actually have a dossier about Alexandria, and that's still a possibility, but it would mean that Anne died first, and then Jadis. I thought her death was honestly a little tragic, and it was cool to see flashes of her time on World Beyond, and even bring up her friend in a conversation. I know most people either didn't watch or flat out hate that show, but it's nice to see a bit of commitment to keeping this universe connected. But Gabriel's presence also makes me wonder about his role in the future of the universe. At first I had a lot of questions as to how he got over to the west coast and back so quickly during the show, because for some reason I expected the episode to end with Rick and Michonne reuniting with Gabriel, but it turns out this scene actually took place somewhere close to Alexandria, which in hindsight of course makes the most sense, and it made the entire ending scene incredibly sad. But at the beginning of the episode we saw a couple different helicopters flying closer to Alexandria and that was in present time. Could they already be over there bombing Alexandria? I wonder if Gabriel's gonna make an additional appearance next week or in another show. It's not like he really needs to, his presence in this show made a lot of sense because of Jadis, but I don't think he really needs to be forced into next week's episode unless it's Rick and Michonne arriving back at Alexandria, whether it's still standing or not. This episode showed us the Rick and Michonne honeymoon, where everything was going their way for quite a while. They found a random machete and a walker, a whole ton of tasteful nudes, and even got themselves some guns for a few minutes, but then got rid of one for some reason after stumbling upon a group of strangers. This is one of my favorite aspects of the episode thematically, and honestly something I think about in regards to the future of the series. Rick and Michonne are kind of going through their own all life is precious and people are a resource kind of arc, so they tell these people that they have to promise them to help the next person they come across. This ends up biting them in the ass because the person that they end up helping is Jadis. And while the two of them ultimately end up unscathed from this encounter, in a different scenario this ultimately could have led to the death of them. Scenes like this make me wonder if Rick is going to undergo an additional change, go back to his I don't take chances anymore type of thinking because this could have ended up going terribly wrong for them. Gabriel did tie into this storyline in a way, finally delivering the ring to Rick so that way he could officially propose to Michonne, which is strange because I'm pretty sure it was Angela Kang or Scott Gimple who said that they got married off screen in between seasons 8 and 9, and also Rick calls Michonne his wife in the first episode of this show. I get he could just be calling her that because why not, there's nobody who's gonna tell him any different, but it felt like there was just something lost in the lore translation for this episode episode between the writing here and the writing that had been previously established. Speaking of which, let's talk about next week's episode and a bit of lore that we thought was gone forever, PPP. In a screen cap for next week's episode, we see this written on the board. Is this just a clever nod to a previous abandoned element of the show, or does PPP actually have a bit of significance? Maybe even something to do with the Echelon briefing. We also see Rick and Michonne with what looks like chlorine gas containers and a warehouse tent type of thing, and a shot of all the CRM higher-ups gathered just outside this structure. I think it would be some sweet justice and great writing for Michonne to get her revenge on these people, using their own weapons against them, but this also has me slightly worried. While I've loved the direction the show has gone in, it's also not entirely what I expected. I was expecting the majority of the season to consist of these two infiltrating the CRM, finding out its secrets, and unraveling the mystery, and while there's still an episode left to do that, the CRM is still largely a mysterious organization. I'm sure the revelation of the Echelon briefing will change a thing or two, but we haven't seen any additional walker experiments, or works of a cure, or anything of the sort, so all of these aspects still intrigue intrigue me. I'm also worried that because all the CRM higher-ups are conveniently at one location, Rick and Michonne could take them all out and that would be it for the storyline. Years of theories and build-up just to be taken down in a single episode. I mentioned this in another video, but I've been pretty underwhelmed with the use, or lack thereof, with General Beale, and if he bites it in the next episode, I'm gonna be pretty disappointed. 
The Ones Who Live Episode 6 gave us the conclusion to the Rick at the CRM arc. For comparison's sake, we got less time with Rick at the CRM than we got with Alexandria dealing with a horde of walkers. We got far less time than Rick versus the Saviors, less time than the Whisperer War, and also a single episode more than we got with Beth at the hospital. In a lot of ways, this episode was very satisfying. Almost too satisfying. Also, in a lot of ways, this felt like the true end to the Walking Dead universe, even though it's going to keep on going. That might be more of a me issue, being a Walking Dead fan and YouTuber, but I wasn't altogether happy with the finale, so let's go over why. First off, I just want to say that a lot of the logic went out the window when it came to this episode. Logic has always been a fickle subject when it comes to The Walking Dead, but the way it was presented in this series had been pretty concrete until this episode. Rick and Michonne blow up the entire CRM, and literally a few seconds go by and they all turn into walkers. The likelihood of all these people becoming walkers at the same time is very low, but let's say there's still a chance and they do. Rick and Michonne survived this explosion by covering themselves in water, but what about Thorn? Where did she just get this gas mask that we have never seen before? Where did Michonne get one a few seconds later? Rick pulls a grenade, but since he was holding a walker in front of him, he's alright I guess? Rick was covering his face from the gas, but so was Michonne back in episode 2 and it took her a year to recover. Is Rick just built different? Does this gas not affect him? Let's talk about General Beal and the Echelon Protocol, something that had been built up for a while, this whole series, and General Beal had been built up for a whole other different series before this, and it was something that we were expecting to give us a lot of answers regarding the CRM. Well, it turns out the Echelon Briefing is about how the CRM are bad people who kill other people and how they're planning to take out their own people and also any other people they come across. But wait a minute, we already knew that. Is that really the thing that was built up for so long? The whole 14 years to live thing was definitely a bombshell, but the way the time skips all work in this show, that could be like one or two more spinoffs. And then we'd be done, and that can't possibly be true. Terry O'Quinn as General Beale, let's be honest, was a little wasted, but he was still really great. I saw a comment about this, and I actually agree with it. Terry O'Quinn is not some A-list, out-of-left-field actor to be cast in this role. Most of us know him from Lost, and he's a journeyman actor. He has bit roles here and there, it's just that his Lost role was so huge, and we associate him with that, so we built up this character in our heads to be more than he actually was. But it's not like Brad Pitt was casted as General Beale, and it was this earth-shattering casting revelation. He did a good job, but it was also a small role for what we expected it to be. Two things can be true at the same time. That's going to be a recurring theme with this series. General Beale can be a good character who played his part well, while also being disappointing for how much he was built up. And that's where I think most of the faults come from in this season, the build-up. Years from now, people will be binging The Walking Dead and then The Ones Who Live. It'll be a complete story, and people will have no issue with it. But for people like me and you who have been watching this for a very long time, this ending feels too easy. The CRM had been built up for over five years as this be-all Avengers level threat in the Walking Dead universe. There was literally a whole show dedicated to showing us how big of a threat they were. And all of this, more or less, comes to an end in a single episode. And it's not an episode that feels as big as episodes like Too Far Gone or No Way Out. This just didn't carry the same weight as those did when it comes to ending a storyline. But I also see people who say that this show was literally marketed as the end of the Rick and Michonne storyline, so everybody who's upset is really just upset that they were telling the truth about that. And I agree with those people. But two things can be true at the same time. This can be the ending that they had in mind for these characters, and people can still be disappointed. The moment came where Rick reunited with his family and it was... alright? I weirdly didn't have the same emotional response that I had when Rick reunited with his family in Season 1, and that was with only two prior episodes of build-up. 
This had years and a whole show dedicated to it, but I still couldn't help but feel like something was missing. It all felt too easy. And again, that could very well just be a me problem. As somebody who researched this topic day and night for years, it just didn't satisfy my needs. I was expecting Rick and Michonne to arrive at Alexandria, see that the CRM had already destroyed it, but Judith and RJ tell them about the Commonwealth and how it has the resources to combat the CRM, and we go from there. But right now, the CRM is defeated, and we have two other spinoffs that seemingly have no direction in the greater universe. That, I know is a me problem because I wanted Dead City and Daryl Dixon to connect to the ones who live, have all of them come together to fight against the CRM, but now that's clearly not the case. If they're truly planning some sort of season 12 or crossover series, is Negan in New York City gonna be the villain again? That didn't work out so well last time, so are they really gonna rehash that same storyline? I just don't see the need for all these stories to connect anymore, and again, I know that's a me problem, because I'm thinking about the videos to make rather than what they initially said about this being the end of Rick's story. But I also feel warranted to feel disappointed by all this build up and have it be done after six episodes, and I'm not gonna feel bad for that. Also, last thing about this episode, everybody's been talking a lot of shit about RJ's act I just want to remind you all that in this age of social media, he's probably seeing all this, and it's not cool to make fun of child actors. Blame that on the director by not getting that out of him, but sometimes you people go way too far with the stuff you say online. This is like a 12-year-old kid doing his best, so give him a break. Kid actors are always hit or miss, and you're all sounding like the people who talk shit about Edward Furlong and Jake Lloyd, so just take it a step back. This was a show that I was very hesitantly excited for. I had built up this whole expectation in my mind about what would happen and also how I would be disappointed by the stuff that didn't happen. Needless to say, this show went in a completely different direction than I thought it would, and for the most part, that's a really good thing. This show was largely a huge bit of fan service for the people who have stuck around this whole time, and that's not a bad thing. Fan service is not this bad word that should be avoided, but there's different kinds of fan service. The best kind of fan service is the stuff that you want to happen, but you don't expect it. A great example of this in The Ones Who Live is Michonne giving Rick the picture on the phone of Carl on it or with Father Gabriel making a surprise appearance that services the story. Literally, no one expected Father Gabriel to appear, yet it did a great service to the story, and, and it added to Jadis' character development. When I think about fan service, I think back to the prime of Marvel. Literally, the entire third act of Avengers Endgame is fan service, but fans should be serviced for their support of the series that they've been a part of for so long. Infinity War had the best example of fan service I can think of. The ending with half the people dying fulfills a comic storyline and also sets up a great revenge slash redemption arc for all of the Avengers. The Ones Who Live is largely the same. Rick and Michonne have a lot of happy moments. They have some practical fights for the storyline, but everything is quite literally wrapped up with a nice bow at the end. This is a far cry from the show that did stuff like this. But maybe that's not what we all needed right now. We needed a true ending, and we got it with this. But this brings up The Walking Dead's worst feature, and that's the fact that there's never any direction or ending in sight. There's just jumping off points. The ending of The Ones Who Live is another jumping off point for a lot of people. The same as the end of season 3, the beginning of season 7, the end of season 8 or 11, there's audience members who jumped off at all these points. A few of you watching this have probably watched the finale of The Ones Who Live and decided that's your ending. You don't need to see any more, and I don't really blame you because there's no need to see anything else. Unless you're such a diehard fan that you want to see if Rick and Daryl reunite, if some of these shows connect, but all of that is just going to end up being another jumping off point before the spin-offs or other shows continue onward. Some of you are watching this video right now and have watched your last new Walking Dead episode. And you feel okay with that, you feel content, and like I said, I don't blame you. The CRM was supposed to be the next phase of The Walking Dead. And there's been a lot of comparisons online to the White Walkers from Game of Thrones. 
a lot of buildup for very little in return. Why was Rick so important? Because he was an A and seemed like a good leader to take over? Why was A and B so relevant in the series just to explain a few people in the CRM? All these experiments on walkers and a cure, well, they can't figure it out, so it's just a dead end. We didn't even see the walker variants in the ones who live, so is that going to be the direction of the universe? I'm going to assume and hope it is because that's all we've got to go off of. This was an incredible series. In a lot of ways, it was a great triumph, and in a lot of ways, it was a great disappointment. But again, that's also my bias of being a huge Walking Dead fan and dedicating so much time to this universe that it just didn't feel worth it. But for a lot of people, it did feel worth it, and it's the end of the road for them. And I honestly don't blame you for jumping off right here. This is the true ending the show deserved. And for a lot of people in the future, this will be where they end their watch. What's next? Your guess is as good as mine, because I really thought the CRM was going to play a much bigger role than it did. Overall, I still think the first episode is the best episode of the series. All the subsequent episodes never hit that high that the first one did, and this felt like it should have been a special episode released years ago, and then the ones who live could have continued from this point. I'm still going to give the show an 8 out of 10, because despite what it may sound like, this is still a phenomenal show that I really liked. Andrew and Denai gave it their all, and this is a very worthy show for them to be sent off with. But two things can be true at the same time. This can be an incredible show, and I can still be disappointed. Those are my thoughts on The Ones Who Live. This is the end of the road for a long series of videos that I've been making. But I had fun with it all, and I had fun with this series. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more Walking Dead stuff, make sure you subscribe and like the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.